Hey guys, welcome back to the Amino Biohacks podcast. Today we are joined by Mike Harwood, my very good friend. He is a corrective exercise specialist. I'm going to let him break down what that is in a minute for you. Um, so Mike, thanks for coming on and chatting to us. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. What is, um, um, what is, what is a corrective exercise specialist? Well, before I get started on that, mate, I want to, I want to actually offer some thanks to you. Um, we'll get into like a big story about me in a little bit. Um, first of all, the product is great. Like the amino product is great. You sent me a, a bit a while ago and I used the intro between some racing and um, managed to smash out some PBs whilst feeling really good at the same time. Awesome. So it, right. sound, it sounds like I'm kind of like... Yeah, shameless plug. <laughs> it's not a shameless plug because you ain't giving me no dough for it, but it's a great product. And uh, as far as as far as kind of feeling replenished between races um, and not feeling sort of heavy or anything like that. Um, it's a damn good product. So you're onto a winner, I reckon, mate. And I'm mate. really looking forward to the, the Alpha GPC product coming out as well. Mate. The amino acids, there's lots of science behind it. So we're just, we're just following the science. So, uh, but yeah, no, appreciate, it, appreciate it, appreciate it, appreciate it. But let's go, let's go. So come on, what's, tell us about the exercise specialist, corrective exercise specialist. So, so in short, um, I see it in this way. You, you, won't, you won't get this from the educational platforms for corrective exercise specialism, um, but I, I see it in this way. It's, a, it's a, an experience that I refer to as lensing. So in effect, the way that you look at the body and the way that you treat the body uh, with exercise is to look at it on a number of lenses. So when I, when I see somebody move, and movement's been my obsession since I was a very, very young kid. When I see somebody move, I kind of try to see the reality as much as possible. So I look at their body, um, you know, in a, in a very sort of deep way. And in my head, I do all these like funny kind of things. So I'll put a lens over the top of that where I look for the actual movement that's occurring. I look for what the, what the perceived anatomical perfect should be for that particular movement. And then I look at, I put the lens of the anatomy over the top of that. And then I put the lens of the, the correction and how the anatomy drives that correction. And then over the top of that, you can actually lens what are the exercises that you can do um, from a flexibility, mobility, from a release perspective, from a, um, a strength perspective, from an activation perspective, from a stabilization perspective. Um, also on top of that, I'm a qualified sports master, um, which means that I can have a bit more of an effect on the tissue as far as mobilization and release work as well. So it's, like, so, it's, yeah, so it's, it's really interesting. So it's like this multi-layered approach, right, that you take to what someone would just see as a movement. You have, you look at it from multiple points of view. Yeah, and a huge, huge part of that comes from the education. I mean, for, 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 your, for your listeners um, who, will, um, who will maybe be interested in, in studying personal training, I'm, I'm, I'm qualified with the National Academy of Sports Medicine. Um, the, the founder of that was, um, I can't remember his name for the life, you know, under pressure. Um, but he's actually a physical therapist in the United States. So it's, it's heavily driven by um, what you might refer to as functional anatomy. You know, so the actual grounding it in science, grounding it in, um, grounding it in biomechanics, grounding it in, in physiology, um, and trying to create solutions which are number one evidence-based. Um, and number two, driven by the, I, I, I guess, the intention to achieve perfect movement rather the, than the intention to achieve volume. That's something we'll probably touch on later in the conversation because I've got some things to say about that. I like that. The intention to achieve perfect movement. That's a really, uh, that's a really good term. I like that. I'm going to have to steal that. We're just getting started. <laughs> I'm going to try and provide as much value as possible. Yeah, no, definitely, definitely. And so what, what kind of, uh, let's go back to your background. What got you into this in the first place? Was it you're wanting to work on yourself or was it just a desire you've always had? Or I, I think, I think I've, I've seen a lot of your other podcasts with the other practitioners and it seems like this is, the answer to this question is, is seemingly the most compelling part of the interview because it's first of all, it's very personal to me. And secondly, um, I'm not a big fan of the idea of like motivation in the in the superficial sense, but how people are motivated from a lifetime of like the stimulus, if you like, of exercise and movement, um, and how that influences what they do, um, I think is really important. So, I mean, in short, from the age of about four, I've been pretty obsessed about movement. 
and I've been pretty obsessed about movement from a perspective of doing it myself, um, observing other people doing it, and um, being able to, I guess the best word would be mimic or replicate that for the, for the purposes of teaching it to other people. And um, I just remember in primary school being like that kid, not in the kind of bossy way, because I'm far too introverted for that, but being that kid who was kind of looking at movement and trying to encourage people to do things better, like kicking a football, running in a straight line, all that kind of stuff. We'll oh, so, it's literally, so it's literally been there from like all the way back to primary school? Yeah, sure. And, you know, I was a, I was a track and field athlete uh, as a junior, so going up to, I guess, under... It's under 20s. Um, had a really rough time going. I mean, listen, I went to a really great school as well. I got, a, I, got a, um, I went to high school um, in Stanford in South Lincolnshire. So I went to Stanford Boys School. Um, I managed to get really lucky, managed to get an acad academic scholarship there at 11 plus. And um, the, the sports program there, the, the education there, the, the value system of going to like a you know, 16th century all boys school was. Um, was very formative on on the more conscientious elements about what I do today. Um, I had a really rough time doing A level, so I ended up leaving school after. I mean, this that's a whole different podcast, mate. Um, but I had a really really rough time um, during A levels, and um, you know, ended up not going to university when I had predicted great grades to be going to. You know, that typical path that a lot of your guys went on. Um, you know, like it was looking like Loughborough, it was looking like sports science, it was looking like that. But that all fell apart. And um, so I just went on this kind of journey for a while. Having left school, I then had to go and catch up my level to a local community college. And it's there I got the more kind of the less academic approach, but very much the more vocational approach. So all of a sudden I found out as I said, well, I don't need a degree to go and do this, but I can start at the level two, level three, you know, high sports leaders award. I ended up working with a lot of um, sort of mixed ability groups. I was teaching, there was, there was local, local kind of, um, local kind of mixed ability schools that would come down, we'd teach them how to play tennis and stuff. So I had a lot of, I, I developed a lot of kind of vocational experience during college. Um, and I'm very grateful to, to, for those experiences as well. You know, your, the, the, form, the formative experiences of what I'm doing today is based on the great coaching that I've received and the great support that I've received along the way. Doesn't it, in terms of foundation that like there are multiple paths to the top of the mountain and obviously there's this like, career path laid out for a lot of us and you're kind of told what you're supposed supposed to do but actually in the real world that there's there are multiple ways to get to get to where you're meant to be kind of thing yeah and i think if that's one of the take-home messages i know i know that i can guess that your audience is is more curious than an audience just from the quality of the product and, and from the, the the fact that it's very research and evidence-based your your audience is going to be people who are very curious about slightly more cerebral or academic pathways into their own sports performance or their curiosity about exercise and movement. So, you know, the, the fact that, and the, the Pilates lady, I can't remember what her name was, but the fact that, you know, she did a, a regular education, uh, she did a reg regular kind of degree, she went off and worked in the city and then all of a sudden became a Pilates teacher. That, that kind of, that, that ability translates across, but it's for me, it's just been a whole life of being inspired by my own curiosity, definitely. Unbelievably great and giving coaches, you know, a great, great family um, who supported me doing doing whatever. Because, you know, it's quite hard when you when you when you're into sports and it's quite hard, I can imagine, if you have aspirations to, to be very, very successful at sports. Um, I'd imagine it's quite hard for parents, it's quite hard for teachers, it's quite hard for people to sort of say, yeah, you should go along that path, or when everybody just wants to play safe. So when you, when you jump into the industry at a later date, and I, I met you back in 2011, um, we, were, we were both a hell of a lot younger then, but um, when, when, you, when you meet people who are coming into the industry, it's, um, it's, it's that which is the most interesting, and I think it's that it's that where our industry provides the most, um, a good opportunity for kind of expression on a very high level. Which is, no, I was, was going to say, it's quite interesting, is like exactly what you're saying, that people, 
it's all an inherent thing like movement training like wanting to be well wellness is obviously obviously very on trend at the minute and there's a, i think there's a gravity gravity for people to move towards things i guess you do the career path that you think's right but then there's an innate calling maybe for more than more than people realize to move back towards stuff that might have been kind of really important to them when they were young um like obviously you're yeah no, I'm, mate, I'm super lucky i'm super lucky because i had my epiphany and i had my calling way way younger than most you know so it's not as if i kind of got into a career that i hated and then got to like you know got to that typical midlife crisis kind of thing at the age of like 40 or something i'm, I'm not even 40 now um but I didn't get to that point before I had to have an epiphany. I had an epiphany as soon as I was kind of starting to get to working age. We'll say like 15, I was starting to do little jobs in restaurants and stuff back home. And it was at that point where it wasn't even an epiphany. I just said to myself, I am not going to do a job that I don't love. I'm not going to get paid any money in this life for anything that I don't love doing. And, you know, you know yourself from, from knowing me personally that, you know, the there is a huge open kind of creative element to how I work and how I live my life. I was about to much, say, it's kind of like a craft, right? Yeah, I mean, much to the expense of like conscientiousness and all of the things that I should have a, a, for a guy of my age. But, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm desperately curious and passionate about music and all things artistic and all of the experiences that I've had along the way which have influenced how I think about my job and movement and even, you know, even something that might be slightly more technical than dealing with injuries and, and people's rehabilitation and sports performance, like that's grounded in my time as a dance photographer. That's grounded in my time as, you know, doing DJing, DJing and music performance and all that kind of stuff. It's, it's all about how do you influence people and how do you express your intention as you're working? And it's that, that's the I guess intuitive skills, which is so intuitive, and it's really hard to, it's really hard to kind of express what they actually are. Let's go into the rehab. Because let's want to talk about kind of like what it is on a day to day fundamental level. So you talk about rehabilitation. Like what are the most common things that you see on a day to day in your line of work? Sure. Um, in my line of work, it's. I mean, I, I work in a in a in a central London um, commercial gym, basically. Um, with like an adjoining uh, physio suite um, because I'm in central London I have a lot of relationships with physios chiropractors all of those kind of people so my kind of referral network is very much um, based around that the most common things that I see um, from general populations um, so office workers if you like are people who spend a lot of time sitting down um, and working and being stressed out of their minds and earning way too much money um, and you know they'll be like lower back lower back injuries, knee injuries, um, uh, sort of upper, upper back injuries, neck injuries, all that kind of stuff. And they'll either be, and it's quite fun really, because all of these people are really humorous because by the time they get to you, they're, they're in pain. And by the time they get to you, more often than not, they're quite comfortable in, in their own lives because they actually did a proper job for a living, unlike me. And they, uh, they're often quite humorous about it because they're like, you know, some of them will be similar age to me. They might be 40, might be 50 years old. And they'll come in with like, Oh, who'd have thought I'd have thrown my back out by sneezing. And, and all of a sudden, like they're in pain and all of a sudden they're looking to you for help. And the physios sent the notes over, they've got a specialist on it, all this kind of stuff. So you're working in a really well-informed environment, but you're also working with somebody who's so clued up in most of their life, but completely, lost in this one thing which is causing problems so there's there's that angle to it which is really i don't know i guess you could call it bedside manner stuff which i really enjoy because you're you're getting the opportunity to for the most part educate very very intelligent people in things that is a complete blind spot for them and that's a real satisfaction second to that it's the um what we tend to find in the city and i know you've you've worked in the city of london as well is you've got a lot of really heavily driven people your triathlete guy that you interviewed he was like you know super driven rugby player worked in the city all that sort of stuff and then they decide to do these stupid things like 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 i'm going to be a triathlete and there's a bit of like somebody else at the office has bought spent 10 grand on a on a pinarello bike and i think i can do that as well. 
but it's very interesting. You know, I've trained a lot of um, GB Masters athletes. I've trained a lot of people who are sort of competing at a kind of regional level in lots of different sports. And and it, with them, it's more injuries that are caused by overuse and injuries that are caused by... All, well, all of these injuries in those two, two groups are caused by a lack of skills, uh, movement skills. And I have, a, I mean, over the years, I've developed a a really logical system through which, on top of the lensing idea, on top of which I help them prioritize what's most important for them in, as far as deploying skills and also informing what their intentions are before they even attempt to do any kind of movement. And just having a progressive, I guess you could call it a periodization, but for those who don't really understand that, like a progressive syllabus, if you like, of things that take them from either wanting to improve their performance to improving their performance, starting from zero, getting to 100, or from coming in like you know catastrophically injured and getting to a point where they can go and do sports or pick the children up or go and do some gardening like getting so going from broken like a minus 100 to going to back to zero and so you i guess you're saying you've got both options right you're taking from minus 100 to a zero uh, or from zero to plus 100 um and it's and, and, and you know experience like you, you know yourself i mean like Coming from that situation myself, like I'm, I'm 37 now. I, um, I had an inkling that I wanted to get into track and field again around about the age of 33, 34. And I'd had literally 20 odd years out of school. Um, with, with what happened in, in high school towards the end of my high school career, like I, I completely quit on athletics as well. So coming back to that and having that experience of not just sort of training to keep myself in shape, but training for a real performative purpose. Um, the experiences that you put yourself through massively translate onto other people. So, and I was, you know, you know, Marvin from, um, from up at Lee Valley from Speedworks, like, you know, just little things that I've kind of had conversations that I've had with him and that I've had with, with yourself. The, 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 the confidence that you need to have, almost the audacity that you need to have with a 5K runner to be able to say to them from the experiences that you have and from all of the knowledge that you have, to be able to say to them, the thing we need to do to get you better is to get you 40 meter speed up. And they just look at you gone out as if they say, well, they're only running 50 K a week or something like that. And it's like, no, the running speed is a skill and speed endurance that you're trying to achieve over 5K is just a prolonged skill. So let's get the skill right first. And through my training with myself, I was doing loads and loads and loads and loads of volume because I wanted to be a fit sprinter. Yeah. But, but that's where, yeah, you know, you were there from the very beginning yourself, like, training with me, like, my, my skills of acceleration were just terrible. You know, and I was getting injured as a result of that. Yeah. So all of that stuff is like, translating that onto my clients. Yeah. From being an athlete myself, but also having all of that background in rehab, like, every step you go along the way to doing something different, you yeah. have so much more value to your interesting and and what kind of i guess so somebody comes into the gym with you you do an assessment so you'll assess them and like obviously is it all referral based so they'll come normally come to you with a problem yeah in the majority of cases as you can imagine i'll, I'll work in a team of about 20 personal trainers and they're all at different stages of their career what tends to <clears throat> what tends to happen excuse me <clears throat> we'll cut that bit out um what tends to happen is um often they'll end up going through kind of like the membership guys, sales guys and all of that. What tends to happen is that there'll be like a, a kind of list of personal trainers that they have that they want to refer to. And often I'm the last person that they come to because yeah. I have to get, I, I can get the cases that nobody else wants to deal with. Yeah. Um, because the things they can't figure out. It's not even that. I just think that most, most of most of our industry at the moment, and it's definitely changing over the course of my career. Like I've got to be, I've got to be really fair to the industry. But most of our industry, for the most part, and for the longest time, has been really obsessed by the aesthetic outputs of what they're doing as results. And you know that really is changing with the more with the more technical elements of, of movements like CrossFit and, and all and that kind of stuff. functional fitness is on the rise, right? Yeah, f functional fitness, you could say mindful fitness, you could say conscientious fitness, you could say well-intentioned fitness. And, I, I, you know, in the, in the way that I work, I've been, I've been modelling intention for the best part of nearly two decades now. So, so it's, it's, it's like really people are catching up finally. 
I, I wouldn't I wouldn't be so bold as to say that. I would I would say that I would say that the, the things that your other guests were talking about who are from more medical disciplines, more more um distinctly technical disciplines like osteopathy and physio and strength conditioning and all of that. Those people have been saying that for forever. And I've been fortunate enough to have made the decision that my work will be standing next to those people throughout my whole career. I was I was mentored and brought up in my early days by really good physios, by chiropractors and osteos. So the, the qualitative approach to movement has always been something that I've that I've had um, advocated to me and I've advocated myself. Interesting. And so if someone comes to you with an injury, they've obviously got movement issues, say, and you look at them through your lens. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, how much like effort do you obviously then you've got the you've got the ideal that you're kind of like aiming to kind of to project them towards like what's the what's the process in that like that sounds like a very complex and hard and obviously I know movement and habit change takes time so what kind of what's your thoughts on how do you how do you implement that um I mean first of all by, by making them realize that it's actually really bloody easy it's really easy mate um if I give you the rundown of, of of what I do with people as far as the teaching so I think it's the central part. Um, I sat down with a client one time, he was like terribly injured and I, I didn't even realize I was doing this, but he stopped me mid consultation. And he said, um, he said, I think it's really strange and interesting, Mike. And I was like, what do you mean? He goes, well, you've been talking to me, you've been talking with me for about half an hour and I've never heard you refer to yourself as training people. He said, you've only ever spoken about teaching movement. And I didn't realize I was talking in this way, but that's, you know, and, and you know, it was, it was interesting to get that feedback from somebody so early in, in the, the consultation period. But I really feel that it's that, and more than teaching movement, I feel that it's informing people's intentions. So the list of things that I want people to achieve, rather than thinking about intensity, so how much weight you're lifting or how many, how, how hard you're working, take the intensity element, which is quantitative, it's volume, chuck it out. Take the um, repetition element, like another volume element, take the repetition element, just chuck it out. Like I've no, that's kind of all volume. And in the first instance, get rid of it because it's creating intensity through volume. First of all, discourages people from, from, from doing it with, by, by training more frequently. If you're knackered on Monday, you're not going to want to train on Wednesday. But if you've done skillful work, maybe not to such high threshold, you'd be able to replicate that every day. And that's what I advocate, people working on themselves skillfully every day. As far as the yield version of it, for the quality version of it, I, I have a list, a priority list of things I want to achieve. Number one, and again, if you read books on all of this, there's all of these like wild, like virtue signaling kind of scientific ways of describing it. I keep it really kind of easy. I, I, I keep it kind of, yeah, I keep it very sesame street. So like number one is posture. And like, if you read all the books, it's just kind of like, oh, the optimum alignment of like, or optimum force coupling and articulating surfaces, never mind all that. Posture is how you line your bones up. So if I can teach you to get your bones lined up properly in the skeleton for key movements, we're winning. Second thing is stabilization. So stabilization, again, it's kind of like the optimum force coupling patterns of muscles working together to achieve like, rub that, get it out of the window. Like basically, stabilization is using the right muscles to make sure your bones are lined up. So, posture and stabilization are kind of synonymous with each other. If the muscles are not working correctly, the, 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 the bones aren't going to be in the right place. If the bones are not in the right place, then the muscles are not going to be able to fire. And again, we can wax lyrical about like, you know, optimum length tension relationships and all the crap that we talk about. It's irrelevant. Like, in the first instance, when you're teaching somebody how to move, when you're trying to get them into a pathway of getting over their injury. You're not going to smash the crap out of them through volume. You're going to teach them how to arrange their bones and you're going to teach them how to fire the right muscles. Moving on from that, num point number three, is just a combination of posture and technique whilst doing something, which is technique. So posture and stabilization whilst doing a movement is technique. And again, you look into a book and you look for a definition of technique, it's just like mind blowing. Just keep it really simple. Posture plus stability with movement equals technique. And the only other two variables that I really want to work on and get stuck into is um, range of motion. And um, it, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of interesting sort of 
debatable point and people get all up in arms when I try to teach it. But posture stabilization technique, and then I often put tempo before range of motion, so the ability to control the speed of your movement. And also we can we can modulate speed of movement by thinking about are we trying to achieve an endurance with this or are we trying to achieve a power with this? Are we trying to put force down quickly? Are we trying to put force down slowly? Are we trying to decelerate, accelerate? Yeah. So and that, in short, I was going to say, out of your five disciplines, do you work on them in that order? Is that the order that you... Yeah, yeah and I love, I love debating meathead personal trainers about this. It's hilarious. Because I, I, like what I'm finding now later in my career, so I, I started PT when I was about 19, I'm 37 now. Um, so what I'm finding later in my career is that you know, I'm doing seminars on this sort of stuff because it's, it's what I'm passionate about and I think it's what adds most value to the conversation. Um, but I do end up getting a lot of questions from personal trainers. And you get that brigade of people who are just like, yeah, but ask to go off squats are the one. And I'm like, so, <laughs> and you always want to lead them in a little bit because, you know, you can tell by looking at them, they're, they're absolutely smashed off their faces on whey protein and, and God knows what. And they'll say, mate, like, I, I don't think, I don't think, um, Posture and stabilization is, is as important as range of motion because after-graph squats are the only way that you're going to achieve good activation. And I'm like, cool, okay. So can you just rearrange that for me? And then can you go and teach a squat where range of motion is the biggest priority above posture and above stabilization? And then can you tell me what results you get with your clients? And don't get me wrong, like the scientific approach to like squat depth, for example. Off my head, you know, L5, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, so, but, but, but there's a, when the scientific data comes out, I think one of the problems that we have in, in sports science literature is that they are producing data and producing studies which are based on high level athletes. They're not, it's not like, it's not like, you know, David's the partner in the law firm who's literally blown his L5 out and we're trying to get him to gradually squat over time to kind of remedy that and make sure that his glutes fly because he's, be, he's still going to be sitting on his backside all day working hard on the, the, the Henderson project or whatever. But it, 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 there is conflict in there between the, the performative part of our industry, but that performative part of our industry is so tied in with like the aesthetics and the look and the Instagram account and all of that garbage. Um, and the quality part of the industry, which is kind of, you know, desperately trying to permeate through. And my, my view is this, if I could take whatever his name, you know, meathead personal trainer and just say, mate, just put it through this field with posture stabilization, technique, tempo, range of motion, do it once, get some skills, and then feed that into your intentions or show it on Instagram, I don't care. If you could just do that once, then you'd be a better personal trainer in my view. If you, the, if results, you get your, the results you're gonna get are gonna be tenfold, right? Yeah, but it's not sexy me. It's not sexy at all. Like you, the, the results that you get, it's just like very few people go on, and I, I'm not on, on Instagram. Very few people go on Instagram and will look at somebody squat or run or whatever and say, oh my God, his, like, you know, his mechanics were perfect there. His landing mechanics were wonderful. You know, all they're saying is like, oh, he's got his rig out and he's trying to, he's trying to sell something. Thanks. And, and that's, um, that's um, you notice this yourself in gyms, like this, there's, there's far less people looking in the mirror now to look at their technique. And so many people pulling their shirts up because they've just got abs that week and they're, and they're taking a picture for their Instagram account. I think one of the things, I guess, one of the things that's interesting about this is that obviously with the rise in health and fitness and sports in older, uh, I, think, I think it's very true for the younger, younger age groups. But I think as people get older and you get a bit wiser, I think, and you realise that the body obviously breaks down after the age of whatever right whatever the science says i guess there's an ever-growing group of people who are out there who now want to work better for longer so i think me and myself included <laughs> like, I'm, like you're no spring chicken either i can't wait until you join veterans i can't wait until you join masters up there you've got a few years yet but you're gonna kill it up there um the, 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 and this this is often a turning point when i when i give seminars on this stuff to to kind of to people um this is often the turning point when the lights go on for people. And I do attract an older audience as well. Um, often, like, we'll get to this at some point, maybe in a future podcast, it's, it's because I play piano at my seminars talking about movement as well, which is... Wow, that sounds very niche. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we, that's a whole different ballgame, mate. I'm basically expressing these ideas of posture stabilization, technique, tempo, range of motion by playing them on the piano, which is just obscure. So <laughs> But the, the turning point in, in every seminar that I give is 
at some point, either as a result of a question somebody asks or either as a result of me getting to that part, it's this. Pain is a great teacher. Definitely. So, I, mean, I mean, I know you've been injured yourself in, in, your, in your rugby career and that's, that was, you know, that we all have. It's been absolutely detrimental. Yeah, to, the, t- the two aren't, the t- I guess the two aren't separate from each other, are they? Training and, and injury, they are, they are brother and sister. And it's this idea that I guess what we're trying to do is we're trying to limit, limit that exposure, and, but also try and take the lessons. Like we all, everybody works and moves differently. And I guess we're all, uh, we've all had all different experiences and different, different levels of injury but i guess it's they're part and parcel of it's part and parcel of the process i guess um yeah. that's what you're trying to and do is teaching very, better movement is trying to limit that exposure i guess aren't you and this is very similar because i you know I, I i did a little bit of research before i came on here this is almost an identical conversation that you had i can't remember what the girl's name the lady's name was the uh the physio was it the physiotherapist you spoke to yeah well, i've done so many now so uh, <laughs> She was great anyway. Uh, uh, apologies, apologies to her that I can't remember her name off the top of my head. I, I've pretty much watched everything that you've done. But, but she was talking about like athletes coming to her and them expecting a treatment like that. Oh, you're talking about Abby. Yes, 100%. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Sorry, Abby. Um, but, she, you know, she was, she was talking about the short-term expectations that people have with regard to injury. And I think that I don't, I don't walk into a client that's injured saying that, this is part and parcel of life, and that's and that and I'm and I'm and I'm wrong for doing that because it is part and parcel of life. It's part and parcel of athletic performance. I, if I allow myself to let myself off the hook as a as, as a as a movement coach, if you like, if I allow myself to get off the hook by saying that it's part and parcel of it, rather than having the belief that there is a movement solution to this, and if we just work diligently with good intentions towards that movement solution then everything can be fine. If I didn't have a perfect ideal in mind, it would be pointless in getting up in the morning. Yeah, yeah definitely. And that's coming from somebody that's been catastroph- catastrophically injured myself throughout the years. Definitely. Um, always been doing stuff that I shouldn't have been doing. And the worst, the, the worst thing about it, can you imagine being me, going to one of my physio colleagues and saying I've got an injury and, then, and them saying to me all the stuff that I say to everybody else? Because you refuse to believe it at the time. Yep. You know, I'll come in. I'll come in. I'll come in with like a. I had, I had loads of problems with my big toe last season, as you know. And um, I, I, ca- I went. I went to. Um, I went to Andrew, my physio, and I, I, I said I came up with all sorts of fanciful problems that's going to be wrong with the big toe tendon. It's going to be the FHL. It's going to be this, and it's going to be that. And he said, Mike, you know this. You're just not strong enough. He's like, you need to get isometrically, and you were saying it as well. You were giving me a hard time about it as well. In that. You know, your big toe is just not strong enough and you need to concentrate on your isometrics. And it's like, you're, you're absolutely right because that's what I've been telling everybody else for the last, basically the last two decades. And when you're in it yourself, when you're feeling pain, you refuse to see it objectively yourself. So, you know, I've learned a hell of a lot from, I've learned a hell of a lot from being an idiot myself. And also to sometimes not very sympathetically call out the bullshit of other people. But also sometimes you've got to be super sympathetic depending on what's in front of you as to how you kind of guide that person to the right solution. Yeah, I guess, I guess it's a paradox, isn't it? I guess this is like the whole delivery part is that you've got, you can have both ends of the spectrum. Like you can get athletes that are super driven and they just want to hear, they want to hear stuff kind of straight up. They want to know how it, what they need to do to get better. And then on the complete opposite end of the spectrum, you can get people that, probably just need a bit of a rub and a pat and tell them that they're okay and actually that can be the the cure to the to the uh, to the problem to the ailment so i guess it's like your i guess the whole part of your job is that it's a case of you're looking at what's in front of you with your eyes open i think that's why it's really interesting what you're saying about the lenses is that you have yeah. these different viewpoints and obviously things you have to work through and like you said you've got your own principle and parameters to work to um which you run everybody through to allow you to really understand what it is that they need yeah and and, and you know i, I don't I, I mean like the obvious answer to the, your previous question which is kind of which has sent us off on this lovely tangent um the obvious answer to your question might have been oh what are the what are the what are the assessment protocols that you go through with a client you know single leg squat overhead squat you know looking at a lunge looking at this looking at that maybe just like you know it's great that we've got this technology these days that you can do 120 frames per second stuff on your iPhone in order to watch somebody run. But fundamentally, it's just like the movement itself doesn't matter. It's for me, it's 
are they able to tick these these this syllabus of priorities whilst they're doing any movement and where where is the skill deficit where is the education deficit and what can i teach this person to make it better because a lot of practitioners that i see and it's, it's lovely that there's so many of them about now compared to 10 15 years ago but you you tend to find, and i was probably like this when i first learned all this stuff with the national academy of sports medicine i started deploying it myself they tend to get a little bit like self-congratulatory do you know what i mean it's just like they're, they're and you see them working they're there naming all of the muscles they're there saying oh this is the movement the, the specific kind of movement thing that it's called and if you've got an educated person in front of you who really wants to know it then then it's great that you're doing that but and i've fallen into this trap before where you just start you just start spewing Ewing. Latin. Latin. <laughs> I was about to say. <laughs> and you just, I, mean, I, I studied Latin at school, but like that, you know, I, I should be the least person to remember any of that because I spent most of the time like flicking wet paper on the ceiling, kind of thing. But, but like, it, it's very easy to fall into that, like, I don't know, we'll, we'll say intellectual kind of masturbation trap. And actually, if you're if you're an effective and if you're an effective teacher, an effective coach, and an effective communicator. You only really need to go there when you're expressing the problem to a physio, because that's when it's great. Like having that academic way of looking at it means that you can go to a physio who's, you can have a meeting with a physio about a client. Obviously you've gone through all of the, all of the, 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 the privacy stuff, you've got it all signed off, all that kind of stuff. But you can go to a physio and you can just go this specific problem, the, do you know what I mean? The, the distal muscular tendon you junction. Can, you can, yeah, I can say you can communicate with them in a way that that the actual patient will never understand yeah, and then a level of depth as well yeah and it, but, it, but the most important thing there is is speed you know physios physios like physios and chiropractors classically and osteos have had maybe especially in the nhs they've got like 20 20 minutes with a client and they've actually got to probably do some stuff that makes them feel better rather than that um so i'm really blessed mate because where a physio might have half an hour to kind of treat the problem very directly and then flick them onto me, I get the luxury of a whole hour for 45 minutes with them where I can actually go problem by problem cross over with even even as far as, you know, I, I do heaps of hip replacements as well, particularly with older guys. And the crossover that you get to play with there, it's, you know, the consultant crossing over with the physio, crossing over with the corrective exercise specialist in the gym. I mean, it's a real privilege to work within that because you actually get the opportunity to communicate with these people and find out what the latest surgical techniques are and how that impacts on this. And, you know, I, 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 end, up, I end up finding out about tightrope procedures for like ankle reconstructions and stuff. It's, 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 it's a fascinating world to be in for an idiot like me that didn't even go to university or finish his A-levels, you know? Well, I guess it's one of these things, I guess what you're alluding to here as well is this, this idea that you... That you want the more you know like the more you learn the more you've learned the more you realize you don't know and then the more obviously for someone like you who's so curious it means you're ever hungry and thirsty for more knowledge and you want to keep expanding your the way that you practice i think i think what's important from a practitioner point of view because i mean this this is a, a train of thought that comes up with with some 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 really bright kids that i mentor is that they and I, you know, I, we all go through this in our career and, and through our, even through our like sporting exploits as well. It's like when you're asking yourself, how do I get faster over 60 meters? It's like, you know, you take a hundredth of a second off and you're absolutely ecstatic, but to try and push through into the next level, it's, you, you just think, how can I get any better? The, 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 the point with, with that is that I think the establishment of a value system is the most important thing. And that might look like just a series of, buckets or boxes that you're taking new things that you learn and dropping them into so quite a lot of the new exercise fads that come through your smile you because we, we we've worked in the same places where these things have come through but i'm gonna say viper <laughs> but you know but something, but something will be meant to be like kettlebells or blah blah you know all of these kind of things i don't i don't end up getting a lawsuit from viper for that but like but all of these new fads, if you like, that come, yeah, you're in a lot of trouble now. Um, all of these new fads that come through, I don't see them as I've got to go and be a practitioner of fad X. What I want to do is like filter it through my system, like from a periodization, strength, stability, power, 
modality, but also see it in, can I teach it in a way that prioritizes the quality of the movement? And then I take that discipline and just drop it into the relevant buckets. So in a way, from, from that potential for intellectual imposter syndrome, when you're walking to work and you think, oh my God, everyone's doing kettlebells and I haven't got a clue. It's like, it's completely reasonable why everyone's doing kettlebells and it's completely within your domain to understand it. Yep. And you and you understand the principles, right? I talk about this a little bit with diet and nutrition. It's like when you understand the, the principles of diet and nutrition or when you understand the principles of movement, which is what you're saying, then yeah. you can take any diet, any fad diet or any diet that somebody would has a that has a has a name for and you can take it yeah. and you can break it down into its fundamental components. And I guess that's part and parcel of the system in which you work in, isn't it? That people they need a simplified version of just getting they want the result, right? So they might need the Viper just to get the result. Um, but when you kind of reach the upper echelons of understanding, you kind of start to work more with principles and the principles are yeah. really pick pick any of those things to bits, I guess. I took an, I took an exam a little while ago and I, I, I don't want to say too much about it, but... Um, Did you pass? Of course. <laughs> it was like, so it, it, was an, it, was an, it was an exam to, to put me up to a higher level at work. And I happened to do really, really well. I got 100%. First person to ever do. So what, what happened was there was a whole bunch of people sort of came to see me from like all of the head office type people to sort of say, well, done and all that kind of stuff. And um, I ended up sitting down with this one guy and having a conversation. And he wasn't like, oh, congratulations, all this kind of stuff. He's like, he's quite curious. He's like, so, so what are you reading at the moment? What are you, what are you studying at the moment? What, what is it that, that makes your discipline so interesting, especially since you've had quite a long career? And um, sorry, if there's any background noise there, it's something going on building work over there. Um, yeah, this guy was saying, so what are you reading? And again, it, that question enabled me to think about, well, Christ, what am I actually interested in at the moment? And it was, it was for the first time, it was like a real turning point for me because I realized when I answered the question that I was doing less reading of the physiology, less reading of the, the technical elements, less, less reading of the, 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 the coaching stuff. And I was actually reading more philosophy. And it was at that point where, because I'd, I'd, I'd caught myself a lot prior to that, um, speaking about this whole thing as a value system, you know, rather than a protocol, rather than all of these other kind of slightly more rigid terms. I was speaking of the idea of quality and the idea of good intentions. Um, we, can, we can deal with intention. I'd like, I'd like to kind of speak a bit about intention, if that's okay, because I think that, that completes the model, really, for me. Um, we'll deal with that in a second. Um, but, he, but yeah, he said to me, he's just like, so, you, so what are you reading? And I was like, for the first time in my life, I'm reading about 70% philosophy and 30% of my actual technical literature. And, and it was a real, real good turning point for me, because that wasn't to say to anybody, Oh, I, I know everything that I need to know now. It's just like I've organized what I know. I've organized any new stimulus as to I'm going to drop it into these kind of learning buckets. Sufficient that I don't have to go out into the marketplace of ideas and really go for it. I can concentrate more on the style and how I do it. And pedagogically as well, like from a, from a teaching perspective, the ability to create a value system or a philosophy around what you do I think is far more important to translate that across to other people, which is which is really what we're in this for. Hundred percent. It's that idea. It's this idea about being able to zoom out and zoom in. I guess, and I guess when you're a novice, I guess you're so zoomed in on the individual parts and components, and I guess the whole part of experience and becoming wiser. I guess is this idea that you can zoom out and see the whole picture and put it together in a in a particular way that obviously exactly like you said with the buckets you've kind of got all the different elements and you put it into a, into a pathway like so to create a journey for someone. So that's a really, really great point. Uh, just, just, I don't want to take you too much, too much longer because we're kind of uh, getting towards the end now, but do you want to run into the intention stuff? It'd be interesting just to hear your yes. thoughts. It's a great, I think what we, what we could possibly do either, either in a, in another, another conversation or we can probably do it as we edit this. I've got, I've got some slides which kind of express this a little bit better. Um, because like we, I've covered a lot of stuff and it, and it might be hard for people to kind of put it together. We leave, what we can do is we can leave a link in the, in the description section. So that basically it drives okay. through to another, another video. That'd be good. Um, 
I was, um, I was really struggling. So I'm writing a book at the moment about this stuff. Just let me know if there's any, this is background noise getting pretty. pretty uh, no, it's okay. No, it's okay. It's not bad. Um, so with all of the other disciplines that I've done, I was very curious about, in, about informed intentions through movement priorities. So getting the quality right and having that produce skills and having that inform people's intention before they do another movement. And I was, uh, I was speaking to, um, is, this guy's gonna, done a TED talk. He's a, he's, I think he's a musicologist or he, he produces like mu educational music strategies on a big sort of macro level. I think he works with like Japanese government and all that. Um, he, he's done a really, really good TED talk on sound and sustainability. His name's Michael Spencer. Um, and he, he was, he was a mem he's a member of the, the gym that I work at, I've known him for a very long time. And I was muddling some ideas over whilst talking to him. And the biggest sticking point for me was I wanted to inform intentions through this movement quality. And I said to him, I'm really struggling with what makes intention. And he goes, that's easy, we've got a model for this. And I was like, please tell me, because this is, this is like almost the completion of my little jigsaw puzzle that I've got going on here. And he said, it's really, really easy. Uh, permission, choices, and curiosity. And I was like, can I steal that? He's like, absolutely. <laughs> so in, in the model that I worked with, I called it the triangle of intention. So kind of like intention in the middle. And at the foundation of those things is permission and choices. So through your, through your coaching practice or through the empowerment that you give to your clients, or actually just through repeating skills and repeating skills and repeating skills, you offer them the permission to do it as a coach but you offer, them, you offer them the ability to permit themselves to do it. You offer them choices. You can, and for me, the main choice is you can continue training in a volume-based way, or you can continue, or you can train in a skill-based way, and you can generate your intensity from those skills. So what I say to people is, generate intensity from skills, not from volume. Generate volume from frequency, which is like, do it often. How many times a week you do it? Create the intensity through that. Side one point, sorry. So permission, choices, at the foundation of the triangle or the pyramid of, in, in, of intention, right at the very pinnacle, the kind of the all-seeing eye is curiosity. It's like, be curious constantly. Come to, come to my sessions and just bring curiosity. Come to, come to a seminar, bring curiosity. Just like open, not like open your mind, because that sounds a bit intellectually kind of, you know, insulting and patronizing, but whatever it is you need to open in order to challenge yourself with those things. It might be like, it might be like opening, opening. I think you just, you just um, sort your mic, right? it's kind of um, robotic. And then click for a robotic. Okay. Uh, no, it's kind of robotic. This, this, might, this, this might, might not be connected to the computer. It's, it's, the, it's a computer mic. It will, it, will, it will clear in a second. Is, do you want me to run that one again? Yeah, just to, just to there, just the top part top of the pyramid yeah so, so yeah so right at the very top of the pyramid of intention is curiosity so the the ability to and, and and that's the pinnacle of it it's not it's not the ability to do anything aside from be open to the experience and as, as a really creative person myself that's that's something that I kind of have naturally much to the detriment of other things in my life but I think the, the, the deficit that most motivated people have, most people in pain have, is the ability to be curious and see through that temporarily. And I think that's where, that's where if we can add value in any, in any way, which is slightly on the esoteric level, if we can inspire people to be curious as coaches. And if, if people themselves can give themselves permission to be curious, I think, I think the movement practice over the industry, I think the intentions of people in the industry, and I think that, the way in which we do movement for the purposes of health, for the purposes of well-being, for the purposes of longevity, for the purposes of performance, for the purposes of like happiness, really. Like um, when when somebody asks me about all of these variety of things that I do, um, they they were. I'm very humorous. I'm, I'm from the East Midlands, so I'm very very humorous and very self-deprecating. And this person said to me, she's just like, you know, you, you do a lot of stuff do a lot of stuff very competently and you have a lot of outlets for your creativity. And I just said, yeah, jack of all trades, master of none. And she goes, yeah, but that sounds like you're doing yourself down. And I was like, yeah, but you have no idea how happy I am. Jack of all trades, I believe, 
So long as you have an underlying value system, jack of all trades, master of happiness in life. It's really, um, it's really quite profound, actually. So uh, it's quite interesting. I've never really, I never known you on these depths. So uh, it's uh, <laughs> very, very. We haven't, we haven't even had a drink. It's great. I know, I know brilliant, guys. Now, listen, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to let you go, Mike. because I'm gonna, gonna cut it there. I um, really appreciate you coming on. Uh, we're gonna get you back on to talk about some other elements. Some, there's obviously a whole wealth of stuff that we could go into, but the, uh, the time only allows us for certain sessions. So thanks for coming on today. It's been an absolute privilege to be with you. It's um. You know, I, I thank you very much for, you know, it, it's timely to say thank you very much for all the support you've given me as I've, as I've got back into athletics over the last couple of years. And, um, you know, no, no, no bullshit. Like, I think, you've, I think you're onto a really winning business and I think that the products themselves are, are, are fantastic and I wish you all the best with it. If anybody wants to get hold of you or find out more about kind of what you do, where can they, where can they, get, where can they get in touch with I can't, you? I can't, I can't, I can't very well talk bad about people on Instagram and actually have an Instagram account myself. What I will say, because I'm writing a book at the moment, I've like completely taken everything off social media. I do have a Facebook page, which is uh, facebook.com forward slash mike.harwood, which will be, we'll, we can link it below. Um, and please feel free, anybody that, that watches this and uh, has any kind of questions or just wants to reach out and say hi, absolutely do so. Um, there is no commercial element right now to anything that I'm doing apart from just banging out my craft and getting on with my stuff. Um, I, you know, if, when, when the book's ready for release and when a few other bits and bobs that I'm doing ready for release, I will be absolutely whoring myself out on social media, but hopefully with some quality, I, I certainly won't be taking my top off because <laughs> lockdown's not been great, you know. <laughs> Guys, if you've enjoyed the video, hit like, uh, and if, also make sure you hit the subscribe and notification bell below. If you want to contact Mike, then we'll leave the details in the description section as well. Mike, I really appreciate your time, buddy. Appreciate it. Pleasure.